All men seek happiness. This is without exception. Happiness is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. So said the great philosopher and mathematician Blaise Pascal. And he's right, isn't he? You want to be happy. I want to be happy. Every human being seeks happiness. So we should really step back and ask, how's that going this morning? As you sit here this morning, are you happy? I mean, truly, deeply happy. The paradox of happiness is that for all our seeking of happiness, we don't seem to be finding very much happiness. Here's some statistics for you. One in ten Americans over the age of 12 is clinically depressed. There are over 40, 40 different brand name antidepressant medications on the market today. And in the past 15 years, use of those medications has increased 400%. We're pretty happy, aren't we? We're doing really well at the pursuit of happiness. Could it be that instead of new drugs, new therapies, new research, could it be that the way to happiness is actually quite old? Could it be that a sermon preached by Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years ago gives us the key to happiness? Jesus was, of course, a teacher. He was a rabbi. He was much more than a teacher. He was also God in human flesh, the Savior of the world, all that stuff. But he was a teacher. And the Gospel of Matthew is structured around five discourses or five lessons that he taught, five sermons that he gave. See, the writer of Matthew wants us to encounter Jesus by encountering his teaching, by coming face to face with what he said. And there's one central theme in Jesus' teaching that stands out as central, and that is the kingdom of God. Now the problem for us, of course, is that we don't live in a kingdom, and so the language of kings and kingship and monarchy is sort of foreign to us. We're much more comfortable with the language of democracy and presidents and candidates. And so let me try to help you understand what Jesus means when he talks about the kingdom of God. I want to try to help you with this by asking you to think of something that is completely different from the kingdom of God, but that's linguistically similar. In other words, it functions the same way in language. I want you to think about the phrase, the American dream. What do we mean when we speak of the American dream, singular, with a capital D? Right? What, what is that? The American dream. It's, it's one idea or one entity, and yet it fuels and it sort of encapsulates all kinds of other ambitions and dreams and longings, right? It's this, it's this picture, this vision of something having to do with prosperity, affluence, independence, success, right? It sort of gathers all these concepts up into one reigning paradigm, and so we can actually speak of the American dream and we know what we mean. We know what we're talking about, even though for every one of us, what that is and what that looks like might be completely different. The American dream is, to use a biblical term, a kingdom, a rival kingdom. It's a, it's a vision of the way things ought to be. It's a picture of the fulfilled or satisfied or happy life. It's something that we're invited to buy into with our hopes and our dreams and our time and our energy and our resources. 
The American dream is a vision of how life ought to be, according to someone's definition. The kingdom of God is a better vision. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he's trying to attract and capture your longings. He's inviting you into a new kind of life. He's offering you a new vision of the good life, a new thing to live for, a new strategy for living life. And this kingdom is not mythical or metaphorical, nor is it personal or private. It is real and actual, and it has implications for all of your life and for all of existence. It's a new way of seeing. It's a new orientation, a new pursuit. And so Matthew, in helping us understand and giving us some handles by which to grab hold of this concept of the kingdom of God, structures his gospel around five discourses where Jesus, the teacher, instructs us about the kingdom of God. And the most famous of these five discourses is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7. And so let me introduce you to this most famous of all sermons by giving you an overview of its setting, its audience, and its function. What you might call the where, the who, and the what. First of all, the where. The most important thing about the Sermon on the Mount is that it took place on a mount. That is not accidental. This is not just a sort of random geographical feature. This is intentional. You see, in the Old Testament, when God brought the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob out of slavery in Egypt, he brought them to a mountain, Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, Moses went up and received from God his law and brought it down to the people. And there at Mount Sinai, they entered into covenant with God and became his people. And so here in the Gospel of Matthew, we have Jesus, the truer and better Moses, the prophet of whom Moses spoke and to whom Moses pointed. And Jesus goes up on a mountain to call to himself a new people, to inaugurate a new kingdom, to deliver to us a new law, which is really just the fulfillment of the old law. The sermon takes place on a mount because you're supposed to realize and recognize Jesus as the truer and better Moses. That's where. That's important. Who is the sermon preached to? Who is the audience for this sermon? Look at Matthew 5 verses 1 and 2. It says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them. So the audience of this sermon is primarily his disciples. He's speaking these words to his disciples. But the whole world is invited to listen in. That's how this sermon functions. It's delivered to, it's given to Jesus' followers, his disciples. But within earshot of anyone who wants to listen. So at the same time, this gives truth to those who follow Jesus, and it invites in those who don't follow him yet but are curious. That's the function of the Sermon on the Mount. That's who it's to, is to his disciples in the hearing of anyone who will listen. And so as you hear this sermon preached over the next 10 weeks at Coram Deo, if you're a disciple of Jesus, I want you to listen because he's talking to you. If you're not a disciple of Jesus, I want you to listen because he's talking to you. He he wants you to hear the kind of life he invites his disciples into. He wants you to listen and evaluate and compare with the life you're currently living. So that's where and who, but finally, let's ask the question, what? What is the Sermon on the Mount? What is its function? What's it supposed to do? Why did Jesus preach this? How does it fit into the sort of overall theme of God's redemptive story. 
In the history of theology, there have been four basic views of the Sermon on the Mount. The first view says that the Sermon on the Mount is a social blueprint. That is, it is a prescription for societal ethics. Those who hold this view are usually scholars on the liberal left who abandon any notion of sin or salvation or the supernatural, but they really like moral teaching. And so they see Jesus as a social reformer who came essentially to help us learn how to get along with each other. The problem with this view of the Sermon on the Mount is that it wants to hold on to parts of the Sermon on the Mount while jettisoning other parts, and in fact, while jettisoning the whole rest of of the Gospel of Matthew, which tells us about things like Jesus rising from the dead. So to take the Sermon on the Mount in isolation from the rest of the narrative is to do violence to the text as it's been given to us. So the Sermon on the Mount is not merely a social blueprint. A second view of the Sermon on the Mount that has sometimes been prominent is that the Sermon on the Mount is an eschatological ethic. That is, that Jesus is intending this for a future millennial kingdom that is not here yet. And so what he's saying doesn't apply to us. It applies to those who will live in the millennial future. This viewpoint is often held by those in a theological tribe called dispensationalism. Uh, which thankfully is a tribe that is shrinking. I don't think it's a very good approach to theology because what it causes us to do in this section of the Bible is it means we have to believe that Jesus is speaking to his disciples about something that has no relevance to them whatsoever and in fact doesn't have any relevance to anyone for another couple thousand years. It's not germane to the setting of what Jesus is actually doing when he's preaching this sermon. A third view of the Sermon on the Mount is that this sermon is a mirror to show us our sin. That what Jesus is doing here is holding up a mirror and saying, here's what you can't live up to. And that's certainly true, right? All of God's commands in the Bible function that way. They all hold a mirror up to us and ask us to evaluate our lives in light of God's commands and demands. And so the Sermon on the Mount shines the light on our failures and shows us why we need a Savior. That is definitely true. But the question is, is that all the Sermon on the Mount does? Is it merely intended just to show us that we need the cross of Jesus Christ and the grace of God? I don't think so. The fourth view of the Sermon on the Mount, and and the correct one, I think, is that the Sermon on the Mount is a picture of life in the kingdom of God. It holds up a mirror to our sin to show us that we need grace to enter into God's kingdom in the first place. It definitely does that. But it also shows us the blessedness of life in the kingdom of God. It teaches us the kind of life we ought to aspire to, the kind of virtue the Holy Spirit produces in us, the kind of character we ought to be longing for and striving for and by the grace of God working toward. Here's how theologian and philosopher Peter Kraft puts it. Jesus' ethical teachings in this sermon are not the essence of Christianity, but they are essentially connected with it. The essence is Christ, Christ for us, our new birth in Christ. But new birth is followed by new life. And this sermon describes that new life. When we become children of God by faith and baptism, we begin to resemble Him. And our lives begin to resemble His life. The Sermon on the Mount shows us the life we are meant to live. Notice how Kraft puts it. He says, new birth is followed by new life. Grace comes first and then obedience. And so notice what the Sermon on the Mount starts with. Not commands, but 
Beatitudes. Not you shoulds, but blessed ours. Now before we can make sense of the Beatitudes, this first little section of the Sermon on the Mount, we need to understand and make sense of the word blessed. Because it's one of those words that just sounds, I don't know, religious, right? Blessed be you. That's just weird. We don't talk that way. But you'll notice that I've titled the sermon this morning, True Happiness, because that's what blessedness is. It's, it's just another word for, and a deeper and truer and richer word for, happiness. See, to modern Americans, when we think of happiness, happiness is basically subjective. It's a word that refers to how I feel about things, right? I feel happy. But see, the biblical term makarios, which is translated blessedness here in the Sermon on the Mount, refers to the kind of happiness we actually all long for. A deep and lasting and objective sort of happiness. Blessedness is a persistent state, not a fleeting feeling. So when Elizabeth in the Gospel of Luke meets Mary, the mother of Jesus, who's pregnant with the Lord Jesus, and says to her, Blessed are you among women. She's not saying, Oh, I'm so happy that you're pregnant. I mean, she is saying that, but she's saying much more than that. She's saying, How graced are you that the Savior of the world is in your womb? What a divine expression of favor and goodness. That same sort of objectivity is present here in the Beatitudes. You're going to see the Beatitudes are not the kind of happiness. They don't describe the kind of blessedness that is contingent upon circumstances. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are you because you fell in love. Or blessed are you because the stock market is trending upward. Or blessed are you because you got into that medical residency that you were fighting for. No, Jesus... Jesus speaks blessing that's much more enduring, that's focused on much more permanent things. Jesus speaks blessing on a certain kind of person. The Beatitudes proclaim to us, here is the person who's to be congratulated, who's to be envied. Here is the person who's truly happy, truly favored. So let's examine the kind of person that's described. Look with me at the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, verses 3 through 12. And I've listed them all on this slide just so you can sort of take them all in as we walk through them one at a time. Jesus begins by saying this, Blessed, happy are the poor in spirit. That is, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are those who know they have nothing to offer spiritually. Blessed are those who know that spiritually they are beggars before a bountiful, holy God. See, to be poor in spirit is to have a keen awareness of your nothingness before God. Poverty of spirit is the total antithesis of the world's value system. Right? What is the world value? What, do you, what does the world put forward? Self-reliance, self-confidence, self-assuredness, believe in yourself, put your best foot forward, you can do it, you matter, you can make it, just believe and try and trust in yourself. Jesus says, no, no, blessed are those who instead of putting their best foot forward, recognize they don't have a best foot to put forward. Blessed are those who recognize that before God, they have, they have nothing to commend themselves. They have no spiritual bank account to draw from. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. These are the people the kingdom belongs to. Not the self-reliant, not the self-confident, but, but those who are poor in spirit. 
So are you poor in spirit? Do you recognize this morning your spiritual poverty? Your utter nothingness before God? If so, blessed are you, Jesus says. You are on the path to true happiness. He goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn, those who grieve, those who lament. Not because they're melancholy, but because they feel and know and identify the effects of sin. Blessed are they who mourn because of the brokenness of the world, because of the reality of the fall. They go through life with a sense of seriousness, a sense of the weightiness, the brokenness of the world the way it is. They go through life grieving and longing for something better, longing for restoration. Again, this is the total opposite of what you hear out there, right? Our whole economy is built on the avoidance of mourning, right? Grief is something you should get over with as fast as you can so you can get on with the business of the pursuit of happiness. That's why we have video games and television and movies and internet is so we can numb the pain of the brokenness of the world. But Jesus says, blessed are those who instead of amusing themselves to death, grieve over the state of the world. Why are they blessed? What is their blessing? They shall be comforted. By what? By the fact that Jesus is making all things new. By the fact that Jesus is bringing a new kingdom. By the fact that Jesus is renewing what is broken. But see, that comfort means very little to you if you're not grieved by the way things are. If you don't have a mournful spirit about the brokenness that is the world, there's no longing in you for it to be made right. And so there's no joy in you when you find that Jesus is making it right. Those who mourn, Jesus says, are truly happy because the kingdom has come and the kingdom is coming. Things are being made new and things will be made new, fully, finally, ultimately. And so happy are those who grieve, for they will be comforted. And Jesus goes on to say, blessed are the meek, the lowly, the humble, the self-forgetful. Meekness is not a demeanor, it's a disposition. In other words, it's not a way you can act, it's a way you are. Now what does it mean to be meek? Meekness is a humble Self-forgetfulness. The woman who is meek doesn't think about herself. The man who is meek is not sensitive or defensive. He's not self-pitying or self-protecting or self-loathing. He's not worried about what people say or think. Peter Crave says that the root of meekness is really the idea of submissiveness to God. A meek person is one who understands what it means to be submitted to God. And therefore, I have a trust in God's providence and God's goodness and God's care for me so I don't have to fight for my agenda or push to be recognized or assert my priorities. There's a blessed self forgetfulness to my existence in the world. Blessed are the meek, Jesus says, for they shall inherit the earth. Remember, the thing we're hoping for, the great Christian hope, is not that we get out of here and go to heaven. Rather, our great hope is heaven coming to earth. John says, I saw a new heavens and a new earth, Revelation 21. And all of that, new heavens, new earth, new creation, new reality, renewed world with no sin, all of that is the inheritance of the meek, the humble, 
the non-self-interested. What about you this morning? Is there, is there a blessed self-forgetfulness to your disposition? Is there a blessed restfulness in the providence and the goodness of God that frees you to just be humble? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Jesus then says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Think for a minute about hunger and thirst. You're only hungry until you what? Eat. Then you're not hungry anymore, at least not for a while. Right? So hunger and thirst are longings or cravings that don't go away until they are satisfied. Jesus says, Blessed are the people who long for righteousness like that. That have a continual longing and craving for righteousness that will not be satisfied until it is attained. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be satisfied. Blessed are you if you hunger to be free from sin in all its forms and in all its manifestations because you'll be satisfied. You're going to get what you long for in Christ and in his kingdom. This is the gospel in one verse, isn't it? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The gospel is The Holy Spirit awakens a hunger in you, a longing to be right with God. A thirst for redemption and for salvation and for cleansing from sin and for relationship with God. That stirring, that longing, that hunger is awakened in you and it begins to cause you to drive and pursue the answer to that longing. Which is Jesus. Jesus quenches your thirst for righteousness by giving you his own. By crediting his righteousness to you. And by giving you the Holy Spirit who makes you holy. Who increases your appetite for righteousness. Who causes you to reject wickedness and to turn from sin. And to walk in obedience and to repent and to desire to be holy. But again, this righteousness is not personal and private. It's it's cosmic in scope. Peter says what we're looking forward to is a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The gospel is not just about your personal righteousness. It's about the longing to live in a righteous world. A world where sin has been done away with. A world where there is no evil, where there is no suffering, where there is no death or pain, where righteousness dwells and is valued and treasured. That's the world we await when God's kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you. Get a little amen up in here. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus says, for they will, they shall be satisfied. So are you hungry this morning? Are you thirsty for righteousness? Jesus goes on to say, blessed are the merciful, the compassionate, the generous. Mercy is active. Merciful people act to relieve suffering, right? It, if you see suffering, but you don't do anything about it, you might be provoked, you might be concerned, but you're not merciful, right? Mer- a merciful person is someone who is moved to action on behalf of what they see and encounter related to suffering. My wife, Lee, is one of the most merciful people that I know. And my youngest daughter, Grace, is the tangible evidence of that mercy. See, Lee became aware of the plight of orphans in 
China, and her heart was moved to mercy, not in an abstract way, but in a way that created action. She was moved to provoke me and for our whole family then to be active in showing mercy to one of those little orphans by giving her a family. That's what mercy is. That's what mercy does. It has an active approach to the sin and suffering of the world. And Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What does that mean? Does that mean we sort of earn God's mercy by being merciful ourselves? It kind of sounds that way, doesn't it? If you're merciful, then you'll receive mercy. So sort of be merciful, and that way you sort of you know, twist God's arm behind his back and force him to give you mercy. It sounds that way. That's not what it's saying. But see, this is the genius of how Jesus speaks throughout the Sermon on the Mount. You're going to see him do this over and over again where he just, he says things in a way that gets their hooks in you. Just in a way that just makes it seem odd, in a way that forces you to step back and reflect and wrestle with the words that he's speaking. This is the genius of Jesus' way of teaching things. Here's here's the paradox of mercy. If you're not merciful, it's not that God isn't willing to give mercy, it's that you're unable to receive it. Salvation is mercy, right? Salvation is a divine gift. Salvation is God pitying you enough to act and do something about it. But if your heart is hard, you are incapable of receiving that mercy. It's only the merciful. It's only those whose hearts have been softened who are able to to receive God's mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now Jesus says perhaps what's the most provocative statement in the Beatitudes. The the one that I think challenges us more than any other statement. Blessed are the pure in heart. If you haven't yet come to the end of yourself, if you haven't yet come to the realization I can't be this way. This ought to get you there. Right? Who among us has a pure heart? Who among us has a heart of undivided loyalty and love for God? Our hearts are divided. Our hearts are selfish. Our hearts are foolish. The book of Jeremiah says our hearts are deceitful and wicked. This beatitude, perhaps more than any other, drives us to God for mercy. It forces us to come to the end of ourselves and say, how can anyone ever be pure in heart? Here's how, by getting a new heart. Right? I can't make my heart pure. I need a heart transplant. I need a heart that I don't have. Peter Kraft says it well. We attain purity of heart, not merely by the imitation of Christ, but by incorporation into Christ. You can't get a pure heart by trying to be like Jesus. You get a pure heart by being incorporated into Jesus, by receiving from him by grace what you can't possibly give to yourself. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is the ultimate reward of God's kingdom. This is the ultimate longing of every godly heart, is to see God. To to know God. to, To be in fellowship with God. Not just to know about God. Not even to just be adopted by God. But to see Him. To know Him. To experience Him. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they get that. Blessed are the peacemakers. Not the peacekeepers. Not the people who avoid conflict at all costs. That's different. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. 
makers, in other words, those who actively pursue peace, those who work for reconciliation, those who resolve conflict, those who run headlong into difficult situations to make peace, to restore what's broken, to bring people back together, blessed are they, for they shall be called sons of God, daughters of God, children of God. You know why? Because God is a peacemaker. Isn't this what God has done for us? He's made peace with us by the blood of his cross. He sent his son because he's a peacemaker and he actively made peace with us by bearing our punishment for sin. Those who are peacemakers are called sons of God. They're they're chosen, called into God's family. They're named with God's name. Why? Because God has made peace with them. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Notice, not blessed are those who are persecuted because they're weird or because they're obnoxious or because they always have to be right and they drive people crazy, right? There's all kinds of reasons you can be persecuted that you can say, oh, I'm being persecuted for righteousness, and that may not actually be true. You might be persecuted just because you lack wisdom or discernment or maturity, See, Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. That is, those who are persecuted because they're holy. They're seeking to be obedient to God. They're longing to be more like God. And that puts them at odds with the world, at odds with people who reject God, at odds with those who don't want to be right with God. If you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, Jesus says you're you're blessed, you're truly happy. Why? Because you're just like Jesus. Jesus didn't get killed for going with the flow. He didn't get killed for just kind of going along with whatever people wanted. He was murdered, persecuted, because he was righteous. Because he was the most righteous person who ever walked the earth. Because his righteousness brought him into conflict with unrighteousness. Jesus says, if you're persecuted for righteousness' sake, you're blessed. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so he brings it full circle to where we began. Do you notice all these blessings, all these pronouncements of theirs is the kingdom of heaven, they shall inherit the earth, they shall be satisfied, they shall see God. You notice they're all just ways of saying the same thing. These are the people to whom the kingdom of God comes. All these blessings and all these benefits and all these promises are just various ways of saying God's kingdom is here. These people are blessed because they receive the benefits, the blessings of the kingdom of heaven. Now listen, the whole point of the Beatitudes is to show you that this kind of life is impossible apart from grace. Right? No, no one, listen, no one is naturally just like this. Now, this isn't a description of any one of your just temperament. Right? Your Myers-Briggs is just kind of beatitude-like. It doesn't work that way. Right? What this is supposed to do is two things. Okay? It, it drives you to Jesus and to grace from one of two directions. Okay? Some of you are here this morning, and as you hear this talked about and hear Jesus speak these words, you recognize this is a life nothing like what I experience. I'm an outsider looking in at a kind of life I have never experienced. And if that's you, here's what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to provoke you to come to the end of yourself, to recognize you don't have a pure heart, but you need one. You don't hunger and thirst for righteousness, but you need to. He's trying to bring you to the place where you would actually humble yourself, enter his kingdom by faith in him, and then become this kind of person. So for some of you who are on that side of things looking in, that's the response that Jesus is trying to provoke in you this morning. But see, there's others of you in the room, and and, You've come into the kingdom of God. You've trusted in Jesus. And and this is supposed to have the same effect on you. You're supposed to look at this and say, you mean that's what I'm supposed to be? I ain't doing so good at that. 
I need grace. I need mercy. I need the Holy Spirit. I need to die to myself. I need to grow in righteousness. I need more of Jesus than I have right now. I need more of grace than I have right now. Right? You're supposed to look at this and see, man, if that's what I'm called to, I need to get on my knees. I see it provokes you. It's driving you to the cross and to the mercy of God and to the person of Jesus from two directions. The Beatitudes are a mirror to drive us to salvation and then a vision to pull us toward transformation. Let me quote again from Peter Kraft. The Sermon on the Mount not only comes from Jesus, but also leads us to Jesus. Its ideals lead us to Jesus, who alone can fulfill them in us if we let him. The sermon is an arrow, and Jesus is the bullseye. The Beatitudes this morning are designed to show you your need for Jesus. He alone can fulfill this in us if we let him. And so if you're not yet a Christian here this morning, if you recognize this description of life is nothing like what you experience, we've been praying for you that that you would see Jesus inviting you into his kingdom. That you would begin to thirst and hunger for this righteousness, for this kind of life. And if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, here's what we've been praying is that this would break you of your pride and your self-reliance and your apathy. That you'd begin to see this is the life you're supposed to be living. This is the life Jesus came to make possible. So how desperately do we need to depend on his grace? How desperately do we need to long for holiness? How desperately do we need to ask him to work in us to make us look more like this? Because this is true happiness. Let's pray together. Jesus, we acknowledge this morning that you are a master teacher. And we see this morning the blessedness of life in your kingdom. And we recognize that we are incapable of that kind of life. So so thank you for speaking these words of grace and blessing to remind us that we can't merit or achieve this kind of life. That this kind of life is a blessing, a gift of grace that comes from you. And so God, I want to pray for two kinds of people here this morning. I want to pray for my friends who are here, who who hear this description of the blessed life, the kingdom life, and they recognize they're on the outside looking in. That doesn't yet describe what they know and experience. I pray this morning, Holy Spirit, that you would begin creating in them a hunger and a thirst and a longing for righteousness that will drive them to Jesus. And I pray, on the other hand, for my friends here this morning, Lord, who have grown lazy and apathetic and moralistic. I pray for those who are here this morning who are good at hearing what you say, but not at heeding what you say. I pray that you would awaken us from our lethargy and from our apathy, that you would drive us in dependence on you, that your spirit would create this kind of life in us. Uh, What we really want, Father, is more of your Holy Spirit to be present and to be realized and to be known in us. And the only way we're going to get that is if we recognize we're failing. We can't do this. And so for those of us this morning who long to obey you and who love you and love your kingdom but have grown lazy and apathetic in our pursuit of the blessed virtuous life, would you awaken in us this morning a longing for you, for the presence and power of your spirit, and for this kind of virtue so that we would stop excusing why we don't have it and that we would, by your grace, go get it in dependence on your spirit. Make us this kind of people and thank you that when we fail, Jesus is this kind of person.